And it goes well with the message. Psalm 36, if you join me in standing in honor of the reading of God's word, and we'll read the entire song, uh, psalm, uh, just 12 verses of a song. That's what a psalm means. It means a song, and so uh, 12 verses of a song. Uh, we'll read the 12 verses of Psalm 36. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes, until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Thy faithfulness reaches unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life, and thy light shall we see light. O oh, continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me. Let not the hand of the wicked remove me. There are the workers of iniquity. There are the work, workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. Verse number seven is our text verse. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. I'd like to preach a message with this title, Decisions, Decisions. We are constantly bombarded with decisions. And in this passage, we have a decision to make. The psalmist made a decision. You and I have that same type of decision, uh, not just once in our lifetime, but multiple times a day. Decisions decisions. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. I'm thankful for the spirit of those here in the church and uh, uh, coming to the, the house of God to hear the word of the God. Uh, word of God. I, it has nothing to do with me. I, I, I hide behind the cross. I've heard uh, many say that many times, and I, and I mean that. Lord, I hide behind the cross. I am no one, nobody, nothing, and uh, uh, anything that I might have that would be useful to your people uh, comes from you. And so I pray, Lord, that you would uh, uh, help me take hold of the, the gifts that you've given me and, and stir up those gifts inside me by the Spirit of God that you'd fill me and use me, give me power from on high to preach the Word of God with power this morning. I pray that the, the simple truths of God's Word would settle in our hearts, would grow, that would make us draw closer to you, we pray. I beg and plead that you'd fill me with your Spirit. I'd rather not speak at all than speak without the power of your Spirit. I pray, God, that you'd fill me. Fill each hearer with your spirit, I pray. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray it. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Our psalmist, the servant of the Lord, gives us an insightful window into the decision-making process. And by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and to his decision-making process, and by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost of God, gives us a formula to determine how decisions should be made in our own lives. By way of introduction, allow me to uh, outline the psalm to help us have a firm foundation for the biblical principles that will comprise the message this morning. Number one, let me say we see the transgressions of the sinners in verses 1 through 4. In verses 5 through 7a, we see the traits of the Savior. And then in verses 7a, or 7b rather, through 12, we see the test of the saints. The transgressions of the sinners, the traits of the Savior, and the test of the saints. We can easily divide this psalm into those three parts. And so let's look at those just by way of introduction. First of all, let's focus on the transgression of the sinners. The psalmist makes the point in verse 1 that his heart is speaking. Notice what it says. The transgressions of the wicked saith within my heart. So he, here he says, hey, I'm looking at the sinners. I'm looking at the, the, the those that are in that are lost, and, and I can see that the transgression of the wicked, that, that there is no fear of God before their eyes. And so here you have the psalmist speaking in his heart. Can I tell you that if worldliness 
uh, had an effect on the heart of the man that was lived after God's own heart, don't think that your heart is immune to worldliness. You and I know that the world is a temptation and a trial. We are well aware well of the t- temptations that David fa- faced. It, it, when you say David and, often the first word that comes to mind, first name that comes to mind is Goliath. And I said, all right, we got David and Goliath. David and, what's the next name you think of? is Bathsheba. Now, there are great highs in David's life, but there are great lows as well. And so we understand the temptations. Uh, but it's, we also see as we read this psalm that the world can be a grief and a grating to the heart of a believer. It's not just the temptations and the trials, but the griefs that, are, are, that affect the believer. Uh, d- don't, don't, be, don't be fooled to think, well, the world is just the, the lust of the flesh. No, the, in the world, it has, uh, the world has the ability to, to grind down, to, to grate on, to, to grieve the believer if our focus is on the world. And we see that. The, the, the world... Uh, uh, though we know David had his temptations and trials, uh, th- that's not the way the world was affecting him in this psalm. In this psalm, uh, the world is grieving him. It's grating on him. And he laments the thought that the world lacks the fear of God. Look what it says. The transgression of the wicked, the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. He said, hey, there's a, there's a worldly man, a man of the world that lacks the fear of God. He doesn't fear God. He loves to flatter himself. Look at verse number two, for he flattereth himself in his own eyes. Don't you see that in the world often? Uh, we we uh, look at in the world and we see the, the world building themselves up, worldliness, uh, building themselves up, flattering themselves, talking about how great they are, how great the world is, flattering themselves. Uh, the, the world... Uh, uh, this worldly man left off the faithful way. Look what it says. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceitful. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. Hey, hey if there was ever a time where, where they did right, they've left it. They've left wisdom. They've left goodness. Uh, they, they're not doing right. There's iniquity in their, in their, in their tongue. And, and they lack the fear of God. They love to flatter it. Uh, he loves to flatter himself. He, he, he left off the faithful. He, he looks for foolishness. Look at verse 4. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. I think that all the garbage that you see in, in, uh, come, that comes from Hollywood or comes from social media, I think about people that sit around and devise mischief. They just think about foolishness that they can suck someone else into in the name of entertainment often. Uh, but how someone might, might devise mischief, uh, uh, wickedness, uh, uh, um, trouble and problems. They look for fool- he looks for foolishness. And then he likes the filth of wickedness. Uh, this, this, man of the, this, this wicked man, he, he, he lacks the fear of God. He loves to flatter himself. He left off the faithful way. He looks for foolishness and he likes the filth of wickedness. Look what it says in verse number four. He deviseth mischief upon, upon his bed. He setteth himself in a, in, in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. He's, he's, he, he is not looking for good. He is looking for evil. And, and listen, don't allow that to be uh, uh, the, the, the commonplace in your life. Oh, how the world just, it's normal. It is just normal for people to leave off the good and do evil. It it is normal for people to look out for themselves and ignore their neighbor. That's not the heart of Jesus Christ. The uh, the heart of Jesus Christ, the mind of Jesus Christ in Philippians 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who took, uh, who, who, uh, uh, being in the form of God, thought it not already to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. Jesus became a servant. It's it's worldly not to be a servant. It's of uh, it's of the flesh not to be a servant. It's of the, look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others, uh, not in a covetous way, but be concerned and care for others. It is of the world to think about number one. It's of the world to think, well, you know, someone, listen, young men, it's of the world to think, well, you know what, uh, uh, let, the, let the, the young people sow their wild oats when they're young, and then they can come and mature later on. That's not, a, that's not a biblical mindset. That's a worldly mindset. 
Let's not, let's not accept the worldly philosophies that we can just uh, get away from the good and, and, and be drawn to the evil and think that that's acceptable, that's okay, or that's normal. Let's avoid that. And so we see this wicked man. He lacks the fear of God. He loves to flatter himself. He left off the faithful way. He looks for foolishness. He likes the filth of wickedness. But as, uh, as we look here, we see, uh, uh, as we go down here in verse number, uh, um, let's see here, where am I at? Verse number uh, five, he changes perspectives. It says in verse four, he deviseth wicked mischief upon his bed, and he setteth himself in a way that is not good, he abhorreth not evil, and his focus changes. His focus changes from the wickedness of sinners to the focus of the wonderfulness of the Savior. So let's look at the traits of the Savior in verses uh, 5 through 7a. He says, uh, 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 look what it says, Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches under the clouds. Thy righteousness is like great mountains. Uh, before, in the first four verses, when he's looking at the, the wickedness of the world and all the problems, and begin, he begins in verse number five to focus on the Lord. No more is the heart of the psalmist speaking of the transgressions of the wicked. Now the heart of the psalmist is speaking of the traits of the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. Prince of Peace. He says in verse number five, the Lord's mercy is exalted. Look what it says. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. How many here would say that, I mean, with the Lord's help, help they're, they're, they can be merciful. You can, you can have mercy. Yeah, a, a few of you have your hands up. <laughs> but can I say that God's mercy is a mercy that's out of this world? It's, it's beyond your mercy. It's beyond my mercy. Uh, listen, I have four children, and there's times when they get in trouble, and sometimes I look down and say, well, I'll show them mercy instead of punishment and, 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 and instead of discipline. And, 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 uh, but my mercy is nothing compared to the mercy of heaven. The mercy that, that resides in, in the throne of heaven, the Lord's mercy is exalted. It's, it's in heaven. It's above that of men. He says, thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. And thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. The Lord's faithfulness is elevated. He says it goes all the way up to the clouds. His faithfulness can't be measured. It's not something that's just a little bit. I have some faithfulness, but God's faithfulness goes all the way to the clouds. It's elevated. It goes up. It goes up and up and up. And then he talks about the righteousness of God. Notice what it says in uh, thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy, the Lord's righteousness is enormous. The, the majesty of mountains. And uh, I enjoy uh, going out to Colorado uh, the last several Januaries. Uh, uh, I'll take a, a week and go with some other preachers and we'll go out to the, the Rockies and we'll ski. And that is a, a wonderful week of fellowship, but also just to see the majesty, the enormity of mountains. And look what he says. He says, thy righteousness is like the great mountains. When our righteousness is just like the, the little hills of filthy rags, his righteousness is like great majestic mountains that can be seen from miles and miles and miles away. His focus is on the Lord. His mercy is exalted. His faithfulness is elevated. His righteousness is enormous. Then he says his judgment. Notice what it says. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. They're extensive. They're a great deep. Uh, uh, you know, we, we talk about mountains, and, and yet the highest peaks of the mountains in this earth have been climbed. Uh, they, they, even Mount Everest, the highest peak on this mountain, there are, are many. Now, many have died doing it, and it's very dangerous, but, but, but it has been climbed. And there, there have been people that have put uh, 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 flags on top of mountains. Not to say that anyone could uh, attain God's righteousness. His righteousness is, is great. But when it talks about his judgment, he says they're of the deep. You know, though people have discovered what's on the top of mountains, we still don't know what's at the bottom of the ocean in many places. We don't have the ability to, to, to 
adventure to the depths of the, uh, all the oceans and the seas. And the, it is a great deep. The Lord's judgment is extensive. It, it, it's, when we think that, well, things are bad, can I remind you that God's the judge? Can I remind you that God's the judge? And his judgments are very deep. Uh, they're extensive. And th- then we see this, the Lord's preservation is endearing. Notice this. Look what it says in verse number six. Thy righteousness is like great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep, O Lord, that thou preservest man and beast. I'm thankful. I, it endears me to him that he preserves me. Not just me, but beast. Not just man, but beast also could not, be, uh, uh, could not live without the preservation of God. And then we see in the beginning of verse seven, the Lord's loving kindness is excellent. Notice how excellent is thy loving kindness. And we see over and over again as the psalmist looks and focuses on the Lord. Yes, he's focused, he looks at the world and it affects his heart. And he says, uh, the world is wicked and, and uh, uh, they're constantly wicked. They don't fear God. Uh, they, they, they like to flatter themselves. They leave off of faithful ways. They, they look for foolishness. They like the filth of wickedness. But when I focus on God, I see the Lord's mercy is exalted. The Lord's faithfulness is elevated. The Lord's righteousness is enormous. The Lord's judgment is extensive. The Lord's preservation is endearing and the Lord's loving kindness is excellent. But then in the middle of verse number seven, we see the word, therefore. When I was a young preacher boy, or even before that as a teenager, I learned uh, uh, this thought, and maybe you've heard it before. Probably you have. It's not new at all. But whenever you see the word, therefore, look back to see what it's there for. All right, so that word therefore is, it's kind of a hinge. It's kind of say, all right, because of this, this is a result. The results of the last half of the psalm are indicative of the change of focus in the first half of the psalm. Now, pause. We've already read the psalm. Well, let's do this. Let's do this before we, because I don't want to take for granted that while we are reading, I hope that when we read passages at the beginning of the passage or at the beginning of the, the, the message, I, I do hope and I pray that, that when it, we're reading it, that, that your mind is uh, reading along with us. I know it's easy to, as we stand and uh, look at the passage, to begin to think about uh, what's for lunch or, or, or uh, is the, the roast burning at, at, in the kitchen or uh, if there's some, something else going on outside of of here or, or where you're going to go to lunch after church or, or, or whatever the case. Uh, uh, is it possible that the Cardinals could be any worse than what they are right now? Uh, something like that. I don't know. But can I, can I encourage you that during the, the reading of Scripture, can I encourage you to, to follow along and, and soak it in, to, to read along with me as I read? I, I, I work hard at trying to read it in a way that it's not just going through a verse and getting through it. And, and I, I hope that you're, you're paying attention. So I, I won't assume that we did. So let's go back over it and let's look at this. Let's, let's, let's draw it in as if uh, we're a sponge, uh, being a dry sponge being put in water. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Notice what happened in the first four verses and then what happened in the next three and a half verses. Uh, um, and now rather two and a half verses. Now let's look, therefore, because of the change in focus, because I focused on the, on the, war, the Lord instead of the world, because I focused on him, uh, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and they shall make them drunk of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life, and in thy light shall we see light. Do you see what's happening here? Here, There's a focus on the world, then there's a focus on God, and then there's this is the result of my focus on the Lord. This is what happens because I'm looking at his righteousness. This is what happens because I'm looking at his mercy. This is what happens because I'm looking at his judgment. This is what happens because I can trust in a faithful God. Do you see that? For with thee is the fountain of life, verse 9. In thy light shall we see light. O continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked remove me. There are the workers of iniquity, there are the workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. This therefore helps us see that his response was not to the first four verses, but he was responding to the next two and a half verses. 
He was not responding uh, uh, to the, the, the wickedness, to, to the transgression of sinners, but to the traits of the Savior. And can I tell you that every one of us face that test, the test of the saints. How will you respond? What will you respond to, or to what will you respond the, the psalmist is not speaking of the transgressions of the wicked. He's not uh, speaking of the traits of the wonderful. He is responding in his test as a saint to the, the wonder, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the traits of the wonderful. When a child of God passes the test, when a child of, you say, well, what are you talking about a test? Well, a, a test is, is basically a response. School has started for uh, many Tuesday, the, the academy will begin. And you know what? On the first day of school, there will not be any tests given. Right? Students, amen. Right? No tests the first day. Why do we not give tests on the first day? You know, why don't we give, uh, why don't we just give a, a year ending exam on Tuesday? Right, let's just go ahead, you come into history class, and, and uh, all right, this is a, a lesson one, day, first day of class, let's, get, let's uh, uh, take, uh, 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 put your books away and take out your pencils, take out a cover sheet, we're going to take the exam, we're going to take the final on day one. Why isn't it that way? Because the test is your response to what you've learned. Right? The, the, the test is, all right, this is how, this is what I have gotten from what I have learned. And now we see in this latter half of this verse, this is the test. This is the psalmist's response to what has happened in his life. This is the psalmist's response to the heart of him saying, hey, the wicked are filthy and the wicked are, uh, uh, fear, don't fear God. And, and he's uh, 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 grieved by the world, but then his focus becomes on the Lord. And now, this is the test. This is his response to the Lord's goodness, loving kindness and faithfulness and judgment and mercy and so forth. We get to the test time. When the children of God pass the test, they are trusting of him. Look what it says in the second half of seven. Oh, therefore, uh, 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 therefore the children of men put their trust on the shadow of thy wings. You know, we won't trust God if our focus is on the world. But if our focus is on the faithfulness of God, we'll trust in him. When, when our focus is on, uh, uh, on the, the flattering of the world, that begins to grieve and to, to break you down, you don't get to the place where you trust God. You trust God when your focus is on his mercy. That it's in heaven, uh, that, that uh, his faithfulness is under the clouds, that his righteousness is like great mountains. The children of God pass the test when they are, are trusting of him. The children of God pass the test when they are satisfied by him. Look what it says in verse number eight. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. When our focus is on the world and all that they build up and the, 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 uh, the flattering of their lips and, and, and how they, they say that they're so great. Uh, we don't begin to be satisfied. The focus on the world is pretty unsatisfactory. We're more focused on what we don't have, what I don't get. But when I focus on the loving kindness of God, I I'm satisfied. I'm, I'm satisfied uh, uh, by him. I I'm trusting of him. I'm satisfied by him. Notice this, and, and we see verses 8. And nine, they shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures, for with thee is the fountain of life, and thy light shall we see light. In the world is darkness, and we focus on the darkness, we're not going to see, uh, be satisfied with his light. And then verse number 10, when the, ch ch uh, the children of God pass the test, they are dependent upon him. Oh, continue. Almost every time I go to the Lord in prayer, almost every time I go to the Lord in prayer, I'll take time to begin the prayer and say, God, thank you for your kindness, your loving kindness, your goodness to me. But then I'm smote often and convicted because I know that the reason I'm bending my knee, the reason I'm bowing my head is because I'm about ready to ask for more loving kindness. 
almost as if the loving kindness of God that he's given to this point is not enough. And it, 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 and, and maybe it's, it, it's Satan working because God wants us to come, but sometimes I'll, I'll think, thank you, oh God, thank you for your loving kindness. But God, it's been so good. I'm here to ask you for some more. I need more loving kindness. I need more mercy. I need more of your faithfulness. I need more of your judgment. I need more. Oh, how I need more. And we become dependent on him. When a child of God passes the test, the child of God is dependent upon him. You say, well, I shouldn't be dependent upon anyone. That's not God's plan. God desires that we be dependent upon him. Oh, continue thy loving kindness, verse 10, unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. God, we need a continuation of thy loving kindness. We need a continuation of thy righteousness. And then we see a pleading. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and not, let not the hand of the wicked remove me. I, I know that, I, I, hey, listen, God, I know that the world is out there. I know that there's worldliness out there. Let not the foot of pride come against me. Let not the hand of the wicked remove me. There are the workers. There are the workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. I don't want to be in that crowd. I don't want to be the ones that are cast down. I don't want to be kicked down to the side. God, I, I, I beg and I plead. When a child of God passes the test, we are pleading with him. We are found pleading with him on our hands and knees before God. In this passage, in this psalm, we see the world, we see the wonderful one, and we see the which one we will follow. A choice. Remember, I titled the message Decisions, Decisions, and that was introduction. Let me do this. Let me make three statements, and then I'll close. Three statements, and then I'll close. Number one, hearing the truth of God may not be a man's choice, but how he responds to it is. Now notice here in, in the, the psalm, uh, uh, there's the wickedness of the world. Uh, we could go back over, we won't, in verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Oh, how wicked the world is. But someone had to come along to David at some point and show him the goodness of God. Do you think David uh, understood the, the mercy the faithfulness, the righteousness, the judgment of God absent of a teacher? Well, I, I, I believe that the word of God is inspired by God and the spirit of God came to him, but God's not going to come and take a person who doesn't know him at all and use him. Someone had to come to him with truth. I had no doubt it was Jesse. It was probably Jesse. I, I think about... Uh, um, uh, Jesse, a, a, a godly man that, that taught the word of God to his, his children. I'm thankful for that. But can I say that every one of us have to come to the place where we can hear the word of God before we believe the word of God. Now, I'm getting somewhere with this. Let me ask it this way. How many of you here today were saved before you heard the gospel? Well, that's nobody. Nobody. You cannot respond to the gospel. You cannot respond properly unless you hear it. Romans chapter 10 says uh, for, uh, that, that, that by faith, uh, that, that uh, I didn't write it down, and I, was, I had it the, t the place, let me go ahead and turn to it. Um, faith come, I'm, I, sorry, I'll get, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It's Romans chapter 10. I have that passage written down, but not the verses. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You cannot come to God unless you hear about God. Now, that's what's so important. In Romans chapter 10, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the God. How shall they hear without a what? A preacher. Aren't you thankful that someone came and gave you the truth? That allowed you the opportunity to choose. Now, let me remind you of my statement. Hearing the truth of God may not be a man's choice, but how he responds to it is. Go back to this. I asked how many people got saved before they heard the gospel. How many here, and maybe there are some here, but how many here chose to hear the gospel? Like you said, 
I'm going to, I'm going to go hear the gospel. Anyone like that? For the large majority of it, us, it was someone came to us. Now, maybe God put a, 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 a something in your heart to, to seek truth. But for the vast majority of people, what happens is you're just living life. You're just going along in your business. You didn't wake up one morning and say, you know what? I want to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ today. I want to hear what the word of God has to say about my eternal life. I want to know uh, what God thinks about me. And most of us, don't, most of us are, are, don't wake up in the morning and say that one day. Most of us are, are living life and someone presents the truth to us. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Brother Frere and I were talking this last week. We were going and I don't remember what we were doing. We were in the car. I don't know if we were making a visit or what, but we were talking and we were, we were talking about the word of God and how it's the sword of the spirit. And I've preached this before. You've probably heard me say this before. The, the word of God is not my sword. I, I don't get up here in the, the word of God and, and, and uh, come up here and come out here and just start you know, slapping people with the word of God. Like it's a sword. This is the sword of the spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's sword. It's the Spirit of God's sword. Oh, what has the, the, the Word of God has the ability to, 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 to pierce into your heart. The Word of God has the ability to, to, to uh, separate soul and spirit. The Word of God has the ability to do that. The Spirit of God is the one that takes the Word of God and convicts us. When the, when the faith, when the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, we hear the word of God in our heart and the spirit of God moves and says, that's right. That, that's truth. He, the Bible uses the word convince. He convinces us of the truth. Convicts us. The word of God comes, we hear the word of God and it settles down in our heart and the, the spirit of God says, that's it. But how does faith come by hearing without a preacher. That's why it's so important for the church to preach the gospel. There's a world out there and we, get, we look at that world and say, how wicked they are. Yeah, they're wicked. What they need is the word of God. What they need is the spirit of God to partner with the word of God in their hearts and, and they would uh, create a change in them. But how are they going to hear without a preacher? That's why we preach on that so often that, that, that it's our responsibility to get the word of God out. And so I, I say, number one, hearing the truth of God may not be a man's choice, but how he responds to it does. And we see the psalmist, David, responding in a proper way here. Number two, let me say this, how we are treated by the world may not be a man's choice or how he is treated by the world may not be a man's choice but how he responds to it is. Far too often, we hear believers, I hear believers, repeating in their own words, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 of Psalm 36. Does it bother you that the world is wicked? Yeah, it does. Does it affect how you live? Too often our focus becomes on the wickedness of this world. Too often our focus is uh, uh, we get discouraged and depressed. And what happens when we get discouraged because the world is so wicked? Well, we take our eyes off the Lord, put our eyes on the world, and we stop trusting him. We stop depending on him. We stop pleading with him. We stop being satisfied by him. When our focus on the world, so I can't, I cannot, listen, I, we cannot change how the world, it's not my choice how the world uh, 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 treats us, treats me. But I can change how I respond to it. Do you have family members that are constantly giving you a hard time about serving the Lord? Do you have friends and coworkers that uh, are constantly 
uh, speaking evil, degrading God's word, or degrading those that might have faith. And it's discouraging. It's, it, it grates on you. In your heart, you're like the psalmist, the transgression of the wicked say within my heart that there is no fear. You drive home from work and there's no fear and it grates on you and it grieves you. You know, you don't really have a choice in how they treat you. But you do have a choice in how you respond to it. You have a choice like the psalmist did. What am I going to do? Am I going to focus on the world or am I going to focus on the Lord? And thirdly and finally, having a test, having the test of where to put our focus may not be man's choice, but how he responds to it is. Say, Pastor, that's a, a test that comes daily. You know, you don't, you don't get to choose when the test comes. There are health concerns that many in this room have. There are family problems that many in this room have. There are extenuating circumstances in your family or in your friends. or that There are situations that have arisen that God has allowed that are tests in our life that you didn't choose. No, I didn't. I wouldn't choose to, to have a sickness. I wouldn't choose to lose a loved one. I wouldn't choose to have a, a child go astray. I, I, I wouldn't choose to, whatever. We can go on and on and on and on. I didn't choose that. But how you respond to the test is your choice. It, you know, let, let's, let's say we, we have a poll on, Mon, on Tuesday morning to start school. The academy starts up and we get all the students together. I say, all right, let's take the poll. Let's, let's, uh, let's, let's do this democratically. We're going to teach. You're going to have math and you're going to have, uh, you know, arith- the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, uh, and, and history and science and all those. We're going to have all the classes. But we're going to give you, that's not a choice. You have to take all the classes. But we're going to give you the choice. We're going to do this democratically. Let's have a choice. Who wants to have tests this year? How many would vote we don't have tests this year? I would bet that every student's hand would go up. The teachers raise their hand, right? <laughs> I don't have to grade tests. <laughs> Who, let's just go through the classes and, and let's just not have tests. <laughs> Amen? The students would choose not to have a test. You and I would choose not to be tested by God. It'd be a lot easier not to have a test. But how does the Lord know if you got it? If he doesn't give you a test. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden. They had everything. There were no tests, but one. The only reason that test was put there to see is, did they have it? Did they have a love for him? Were they going to be loyal to him? Were they going to live for him? The only reason God allows tests, think about the life of Job. Test him, Satan. I I think he's mine. I I, I think he'll be faithful to me. The only reason that God allows tests in our lives is to see if we will be dependent upon him, if we will trust him, if we will be satisfied by him, if we will plead with him. Hey, you don't really get the choice of whether you're going to have a test or not. But you do have a choice in how you'll respond to it. Do you remember when you heard the gospel for the first time? How many, this is always an interesting question to me, how many accepted Christ, how many received the gospel of Jesus Christ the very first time you heard it? One, two. In a crowd full of people here, two of us received it the very first time. Most of us, it took many times. Not the first or the second or the third. Some of us, it took hundreds of times to hear the truth before we received it. Now, as a child of God, you have the privilege to hear the word of God regularly. What we do, our heart does this. 
David's heart did it. He begins to look at the world and juxtapose God's blessings and the world's wickedness. What we must do is be, be faithful to focus on the attributes of God and not the world. And if we are found doing so, we'll pass the test of being dependent upon him, of pleading with him, of trusting him, of being satisfied by him. That test will be passed if our focus is in the right place. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I I thank you for your love for us, your loving kindness, uh, your righteousness, your mercy, your judgment, your faithfulness. Lord, you're so good to us. We thank you for that. I I thank you for that. I praise you for that. Lord, help us, I pray, to focus on your goodness to us, to trust in you, to to, uh, plead with you, to be satisfied with you, to depend on you, because you can be, you can satisfy, and you you can be pleaded with, and you can be depended on, and you, you can be trusted. Oh, God, help us, Lord, I pray, to, to pass the tests of life that come along. Help us, Lord, I pray, to keep our focus off the wickedness of the world and focus on the righteousness of God and, and, and be what we need to be, Lord, I pray. Jesus Christ, I pray with our heads back.